everyone. Thank you for coming to the uh, LPI virtual seminar this week. Uh, our guest this week is uh, Catherine Neisch of the University of Western Ontario and the Planetary Science Institute. Uh, Catherine's a uh, co eye on the Dragonfly lander uh, to headed to Titan, and uh, just and that is what she will be uh, giving her talk on today. Uh, thank you so much for coming, uh, Catherine. Really appreciate that. Uh, as a reminder, please leave your uh, microphones muted during the talk. If you have any questions uh, during the talk, please feel free to uh, type them into the chat and uh, we'll either address them uh, during the talk or uh, I will read them off after the talk uh, during our question time. Uh, with that, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, please take it away. All right. Thanks, Sean, and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, as Sean mentioned, my name is Catherine Nish. I'm uh, an associate professor at the University of Western Ontario and a senior research scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. Um, and I'm so sorry for, for mispronouncing your last name. I should have. That's thought. okay. It's very common. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, I've been studying Titan for the past 16 years now, which makes me uh, feel older than. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sometimes, uh, but it's, it's a fascinating world that really caught my attention when I started grad school in, in 2004, right when uh, Cassini uh, arrived at Saturn. And I've, I'm so excited to see Dragonfly uh, be successful and, and, and to see what we're going to find out about Titan in the coming years. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of a bit of a background about Titan and why we need to go back there with Dragonfly and then provide some of the specifics about the mission itself. So if you do have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. As I was telling Sean earlier, I've gotten very used to um, handling questions on the fly after teaching undergrads online this past year. So let's start um, with a picture. I can advance my slides. Of, of one of my favorite places, okay, my favorite place in the solar system. And although what mostly what you're seeing here is this gorgeous picture of Saturn with a very thin ring plane showing the shadows on Saturn, my favorite place is this rather unassuming orange blob here just in front of, of Saturn. And that is Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Um, and Titan really is a standout in the solar system, even though it, it, it doesn't look like much when you look at it in visual wavelengths, it, it really is unusual. Um, when you compare it to the other moons of the solar system, um, you can see it's both one of the largest, uh, just shy of Ganymede in size, um, but it's also the only one with a substantial atmosphere. So um, Callisto and Ganymede are similar sizes, but they don't show the same sort of atmosphere. Um, and of course, everyone knows our own moon does not have, lack substantial atmosphere as well. And, and this was discovered back in the 40s by Gerard Kuiper. Uh, we realized that there was methane in the atmosphere. Uh, and so it's always been this sort of mysterious uh, creature in the outer solar system. So um, when it came time to explore the outer solar system, it was very high on the priority list uh, of targets and, and was one of the targets for the Voyager 1 spacecraft in 1980. So that was the first spacecraft to visit Titan. Um, and it was already of interest because of its strange atmosphere um, that they actually made a, a special flyby of Titan. So um, whereas Voyager 2 went on to visit Uranus and Neptune, Voyager 1 made a close flyby of Titan um, such that it got ejected from the solar system uh, away from Uranus and, Uranus and Neptune. So that's how important uh, people thought Titan was at the time to make a special flyby. Um, but it wasn't until the Cassini-Huygens mission in the 2000s that we really learned more about um, this planet. And the reason is this. So in 1980, when Voyager visited Titan, we know so little about it um, that we weren't able to design Voyager in a way uh, to see the surface. So all the cameras they had on Voyager were basically unable to see the surface of Titan. And so all we got in terms of geology was this orange blob. Um, there was wonderful science that was done with atmospheric chemistry and understanding how large Titan was, uh, which was something we didn't know before Voyager. Uh, because of the atmosphere. Um, but in terms of surface geology, th there, there was not much that came out of Voyager. 
But what we did learn is how to see the surface. Um, so when Cassini was being developed in the 80s and 90s, uh, it was able to be designed in such a way that the instruments on board would be able to penetrate this thick, hazy uh, atmosphere and, and see to the surface. And so it really, it wasn't until 2004 that this, you know, orange blob turned into this magnificent world that we now know as Titan. And so here is a picture of Titan taken from the Visual and Infrared Mapping Spectrometer, or VIMS, on the Cassini mission. Um, and it really is a wonderful and weird place that is very strangely Earth-like, as we'll see here in a moment. Um, but what you're seeing here are this orangish brown area that sort of engulfs the equator, our, our huge sand seas. Uh, there's more sand on Titan than basically any other place in the solar system, uh, you know, per area. Um, there are impact craters. Here's one of the freshest ones. You can see Sinlap right in the middle of, of the image. Uh, this blue material here we think is enriched in water ice. So Titan is an icy moon. Um, but you don't actually see very much ice on the surface. That's because it's coated in all these organic molecules coming from its atmosphere. Um, and then this green, greenish, bright greenish stuff that takes over most of the world, um, we actually don't know what it is. I have my own ideas, but, um, but most of Titan is, is sort of this organic uh, mixture that we're still trying to understand. And we won't really truly understand it until we have a lander there because it's very, very hard to detect the composition of the surface when you're looking through a thick atmosphere filled with organics. <clears throat> but Cassini really revealed Titan to be this bizarro Earth is what I like to call it. It looks like Earth, but all the ingredients are wrong. So we see storms on Titan. That's what this bright white um, features here near the equator are. These are actually clouds but they're not clouds of water, uh, they're clouds of methane, uh, causing methane rainstorms that darken the surface. And then as the surface dries, it gets brighter again. And we've seen evidence of that. Um, the storms are not as common on Titan as they are on Earth, but, they, but they've clearly uh, altered the landscape as we can see um, here. Here's an image from the Huygens probe as it was landing. Um, this is one of the first clear images of the surface of Titan that we got. And I, I remember, um, you know, seeing this image in one of the classrooms at, in the Kuiper building at, at LPL and, and just thinking that, you know, I was looking at an airplane window at, um, you know, Tucson rather than the surface of, a, of an alien world, uh, 10 AU from the sun. I, I'm not sure people were really expecting to see these features. Um, and now 16 years later, it's sort of commonplace, but it's still wild to think that there were methane rainfalls that cut these streams into this hillside, um, draining down into a, a river valley, an ancient dried out river valley that Huygens eventually landed in. Uh, another big surprise uh, were these giant lakes and seas of hydrocarbons near the North Pole and South Pole of Titan. Um, so this is the North Pole of Titan right here. Um, three of the largest bodies of liquid there, Ligia Mare, Kraken Mare, and Punja Mare um, up here, along with a lot of, of little lakes uh, nearby. Um, and, and actually people had expected to find a lot more liquid on Titan. Um, my former PhD advisor, Jonathan Lunin, thought that perhaps there was an entire ocean of ethane and methane on Titan. Um, but in fact, it, it appears to be much, much more of a desert world with most of the liquids confined to the poles. Um, so this was quite a revelation though, to find these huge bodies of liquid um, here, here at the poles, um, very, very similar in size to the Great Lakes um, near where I live uh, for context. How do we know that they're lakes? Um, maybe they're just very flat playas or some other geologic feature. Um, well, this is, this is some evidence we got from the, the VIMS instrument um, uh, from a, a specular glint off of one of those lakes. And, and you really only get that if you have a, an object that's as smooth as liquid. Um, so, so some of you might be familiar with this if you've ever been in an airplane near, near dusk or dawn, passing over a river or a lake. You might have been blinded um, as, as the sun perfectly reflects off, off this mirror-like surface and then into your eyeball. Um, very common phenomenon on Earth where liquids are also very common. So 
Titan, like Earth, um, is a place where you can find liquids on the surface. And these are actually the only two places in the solar system that we know of that have liquids on their surface. They're just very different liquids because the temperature on Titan is so, so very cold. I also mentioned the sand dunes. Here's a close-up image of those dunes taken by the Cassini radar Im imager. Um, so all of these lines that you see here are huge uh, linear dunes of sand stretching across Titan's equator. Um, but it's not the sort of sand you're gonna find, you know, if you go, go to the beach down there in Galveston. Um, this is, I like to call it carcinogenic sand. It's made entirely of organic molecules. Um, how this, these sand grains are formed, we still don't know. Um, it, it's a conundrum on how, to, how we get these very small organic particles from the atmosphere into large um, sand-sized grains that can be saltated across the surface. That, that remains a, a big question and something we're hoping to answer with Dragonfly, but it, somehow it happens because we see these everywhere uh, on Titan. Um, and, and actually, um, this is an area just like this is where we're planning to land with Dragonfly. There is some controversy over whether or not there are volcanoes on Titan. Uh, getting volcanism on an icy world is, is very difficult. If you've ever um, sat down with a nice cold glass of water with some ice cubes, you'll notice they're floating, right? So how do you get the, the water underneath those ice cubes to, to get up and over the ice cubes uh, since it is more dense? And that's a big question for icy worlds. How do you get uh, the magma there, which is liquid water, to get up and over this floating ice crust and onto the surface. Uh, there are perhaps some ways that you can do it, um, but cryovolcanism is probably pretty rare. Um, this is probably the best evidence we have of it on Titan. This is um, a feature called Sotra, Sotra Facula. Um, it's now renamed Doom Mons. Um, and you can see this, uh, this long, what we think is a lava flow emanating from what we think is perhaps a cryovolcanic caldera here. Um, and and it, it has a slightly different spectral signature. That's what the color indicates as opposed to the uh, surrounding sand dunes. So something very interesting is happening here and there might have been liquid water flowing over the surface of Titan. Another place though, we're more certain you're gonna get liquid water is in impact craters. So this is Synlap, that was the crater I showed you earlier on that global view of Titan with the VIMS instrument. Uh, now, you know, closer up in, in radar imagery. Um, and what happens when you have a comet hit the surface of Titan, it will melt the surface uh, because it is such a high energy event causing a, a large deposit of impact melt to form um, in the center of the crater. Um, and so these impact melts, depending on how thick they are, may last for hundreds of years before freezing at uh, Titan's very chilly surface conditions. Um, but that's very interesting, um, especially if you're interested in astrobiology, because this rep represents a place where you can mix liquid water with uh, the abundant organic molecules that are raining down from Titan's atmosphere to perhaps produce something of biological interest. So in summary, Titan represents a really amazing uh, opportunity for exploration. It's, um, it's an icy world with a subsurface ocean uh, represented here by this, this figure. Um, it also has an atmosphere uh, filled with organic molecules that rain down onto this icy surface. Um, so if you're interested in understanding uh, the processes that led to the origin of life, Titan represents sort of this cold laboratory uh, for doing just that. It's sort of like uh, the, uh, the early earth frozen in time, um, and then we can go explore the first steps towards life um, that were potentially taken four and a half billion years ago on earth. So I've alluded to this atmosphere uh, on Titan. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so it's made primarily of methane and nitrogen. So Kuiper first discovered methane in 1944. The nitrogen we didn't actually know about until Voyager arrived. There was some suspicion that there was another molecule there, uh, but it's very hard to detect spectrally. Um, so without those uh, instruments on Voyager, it was 
sort of unknown what made up the majority of Titan's atmosphere. And it turns out it's, it's nitrogen. So again, it's very similar to Earth. Earth and Titan are the, uh, the only two objects in the, in the solar system with a primarily nitrogen atmosphere. On Earth, it's about 75% nitrogen. On Titan, it's about 95%. So it really is an extensive nitrogen atmosphere with just a few percent methane. Uh, but unlike Earth, which is a very oxidizing atmosphere, Tethane, meth, uh, Titan has a very reducing atmosphere. Um, and, and that's, so there's, there's lots of hydrogen around. Um, and that's great if you're trying to make um, interesting organic molecules. So what happens to these two molecules is um, they're photo dissociated um, through ultraviolet light and through charged particles coming from Saturn. Uh, and they, they get turned into uh, little radicals, which then can recombine to form much larger and more interesting organic molecules. Um, so the simplest of these would be ethane, um, and, and there is evidence for um, ethane liquids on the surface of Titan, although not nearly as much as we were expecting. So that remains an open question. Um, the very explosive acetylene, um, some nitriles, which are very interesting if you're interested in, in the origin of life, all the way up to almost protein-sized molecules lingering in, in Titan's atmosphere. Um, there is evidence from Cassini of molecules, 10,000 atomic mass units. So just enormous, enormous molecules. Um, but we weren't able to properly identify them with Cassini. So again, this is some, a place where, where dragonfly can come in. So we have these complex uh, organic molecules on Titan. We have the occasional uh, liquid water reservoir um, if you're able to melt the surface or transport it down to the subsurface. Um, so this makes Titan an incredibly interesting place to study in terms of origins of life research. I, I teach a third year class in astrobiology and the one thing I hope the students take away from the course is that there's really three things you need for life. You need an energy source, you need a, a solvent, and you need a certain essential elements. And Titan has all three of these. Um, in terms of energy, um, it gets energy from the sun, which acts to dissociate those molecules in its atmosphere. It also has some internal geothermal energy that might be able to be utilized. It has carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, in, a, in oxygen in abundance. Um, we really don't know, though, if there's any phosphorus or, or sulfur left over. So our schnapps on Titan might turn into snow. But, uh, but you know, perhaps it's possible to to form a life form uh, with just these four elements and, and some other minor elements. Again, this is something we want to learn more about with Dragonfly. What are the minor elements on Titan? How might they can contribute to the origin of life? And then in terms of solvents, actually Titan has them in abundance. Uh, I mentioned uh, two of them already. Um, those are, you know, met these methane ethane lakes that we see near the poles. Um, this would be weird life. Um, because this is nothing like the life we would find on Earth, trying to construct a life form that could live in uh, a liquid hydrocarbon at 94 Kelvin is not something people have thought a lot about. Um, and it seems incredibly difficult, not necessarily because of the ingredients, but because of the temperature. Um, kinetics slow way down as you go down in temperature. Um, and so it just, it might be very difficult to have life operate at such a slow pace. But maybe there's some sort of slow life that would just, that is present, but it might be hard to detect. So I'm actually personally more interested in the, the solvent that we do know about, which is water. Um, and this, is, this would be more life as we know it. Um, so water is not obviously stable on the surface of Titan. It freezes quite quickly, but if you have a large enough uh, amount of liquid water, um, you have some time for that aqueous chemistry to proceed before it freezes solid. As I mentioned for impact craters, um, you might have several hundred years for, uh, for aqueous chemistry to occur on the surface of Titan. Um, and if you have a lander, you might be able to go uh, see what the results of that experiment are. Even more interesting, if you had a large enough impact, you might be able to bring the organics on the surface down into the ocean, uh, where the conditions are perhaps a little bit nicer for life. And so there could po possibly be subsurface life forms on Titan as well. And so this was a question I actually tackled um, in my PhD dissertation at the University of Arizona. I wanted to know sort of more about what sort of molecules you might make if you took the organics on Titan's surface and mixed them with, with water. 
Um, <clears throat> so I took uh, what we what we term Titan Tholins. Tholin is is uh, was termed uh, by by Carl Sagan. It it's a loose translation of muddy in Greek, and that's because um, they do look awfully brown and muddy when you make them. Basically, how they're made is you take methane and nitrogen gas. You add energy. In the case here, this is spark electrical energy. You can also make them by exposing them to UV light. Um, and you leave this for a couple of days, and then you get this brown, muddy tholin substance. Um, I, I worked very hard not to get any of it on myself because it is filled with carcinogens. Um, there's some thought that the cancer that killed Car Carl Sagan was related to his work with tholins. Um, so one person's cancer is another person's, I guess, origin of life study. Um, and then what happens if you, so these have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen in them. If you expose them to liquid water, you add that oxygen in, and then you can create uh, pre-biological pre -biological molecules like amino acids. Um, and so one of the amino acids we were able to show that we made under these conditions was glycine, which is the simplest one. There were, um, I think, seven amino acids in total that we were able to show evidence uh, for, for creating. And we did this at reasonable conditions. Um, so cold temperatures with some, perhaps some ammonia in the liquid water. And, and even so, it's really easy to make uh, these, these amino acids. Here's just a, a quick, quick plot to show uh, some of these results. Um, this was liquid chromatography mass spectrometry done with some colleagues of mine at, at NASA Goddard. Um, and, and you can see, so serine, alanine, glycine, these are the three simplest amino acids. Uh, these are our standards. Um, so these, you just buy these from a chemical store. Um, and this is where the peaks were. If we compare them to our tholin sample, which had been sitting at room temperature for about two years, um, you can see the peaks are, are very similar, uh, which gave us confidence that we had uh, these three amino acids present in our sample. So it seems very easy to produce uh, pre-biological molecules uh, at the sorts of conditions you would find on Titan. Um, and given that we have probably hundreds of years uh, for these reactions to take place, um, you know, the chemistry hopefully has gone even further. Um, some other work I did is for my PhD, um, I looked at how fast these reactions uh, took place. And you can see that while it does, um, it does take longer at lower temperatures, um, it's still a reasonably fast um, reaction time. So one of these reactions took two hours at 40 C, at zero C it took four days. So still reasonably fast time scales. Um, so certainly possible that these were happening in uh, uh, impact melts on, on Titan's surface. And this is basically what I concluded in my, my dissertation, uh, which was published in December of 2008. Um, so at the time, um, I'm gonna zoom in here on this, this one part of my dissertation. Uh, at the time, there was talks about having a, a flagship mission to Titan. Um, at that point, um, as you know, that, that did not happen. Um, but I was convinced that if we could just get a mission to Titan, we could see the results of these natural experiments that it had been conducting, right? In the lab, we can only monitor those reactions for so long. Um, but on Titan, the reactions have been taking place for hundreds of years. Um, so that really gives us a, a window into the sorts of, of chemistry you might expect to find on a planet where life is originating. So I really wanted to see what, what the results of these natural experiments were. Um, but then Vision and Voyages came out in 20, uh, for the decadal survey uh, from 2013 to 2022. And, and sadly, Titan did not make the cut, as you all probably know. So for flagship missions up here, um, you can see that uh, they ranked the Europa orbiter over the Titan flagship mission. And, and now Clipper is, is you know, in, in development, um, which is a great thing, but you know, no, no room for Titan there. You can, can't have too many flagships. And then in terms of new frontiers, um, it was not listed in the decadal survey. So my great hopes for, for having an opportunity to go sample the results of these prebiotic experiments happening on Titan did not seem very um, optimistic. Um, 
And since the outer solar system is so far away, you really only get kind of one of these missions in your, in your career. So um, I wasn't sure if I'd ever see Titan again. Um, and so I kind of moved on to different projects, but Titan certainly definitely uh, kept its hold of my, my heart. Um, so in January of 2016, when this email showed up in my inbox, uh, I was very interested. Um, so this was the New Frontiers 4 announcement. And even though it wasn't listed in the decadal survey, um, the call for New Frontiers 4 listed ocean worlds, including Titan and Enceladus, as potential candidates for New Frontiers 4. Um, and so I was very interested to get a call from my colleague, colleague uh, Dr. Jason Barnes, a couple months later, saying that they had this idea for, for a Titan mission that, that we could propose for, for this opportunity. Um, and so if you, uh, this was a, a couple of years ago, I'm not sure if they've updated this, but on Wikipedia, if you look at the, the history, um, you can see that Dragonfly was a concept that uh, Dr. Barnes and, and Dr. Ralph Lorenz came up with over dinner, um, you know, shortly after this, uh, this call, call came out. Uh, and both were very interested in how you might be able to use aerial vehicles on Titan. Uh, Jason had proposed a mission called Aviator that would have used the um, ASRG uh, to a small radioisotope powered generator to fly around Titan. Um, Ralph had thought about helicopters and balloons on Titan. Um, and, you know, over the past decade, drones have become a very big deal um, in, in scientific research. And so they hit on this idea, it turned out to be a great idea, to use um, an aerial um, spacecraft to explore Titan. And so their discussion over dinner turned into uh, the dragonfly fly concept. Um, and I, I don't think people, people were so focused, I think, on the whole rover mentality that this idea of flying around a planet just wasn't in people's consciousness. Um, and that's because there's a lot of terrible places to fly in the solar system and only a couple of good places to fly. Um, and so while rovers, I think, are definitely the right choice for Mars, um, on Titan, with its large, thick atmosphere, you can actually get around a lot more easily by flying. Um, so, um, and, and indeed, with one hop of Dragonfly, we can go the entire distance Opportunity went over its 10-year lifetime. Um, so it really allows you to see a lot of a planet um, in a very efficient way if the atmosphere is, is suitable. Um, so with this concept, we could finally address some of those open questions we have about the surface chemistry of, of Titan and its, and its geology and its habitability um, by using an aerial asset. Um, and if you don't believe me that it's easy to fly around on Titan, uh, perhaps you would trust the authors of XKCD. who have a wonderful article called Interplanetary Cessna, where they basically were trying to see if you took a standard Cessna how easily it would fly on different planets um, in the solar system. And so I, as you can see, it, it, would, it would crash quite quickly on Mars um, and of course all the airless satellites. It would do a decent job on Earth but, and, and also on Titan. And in fact, Titan might be a better place to, to fly than Earth um, because it has this thick atmosphere and a low gravity. Um, the air is actually four times as dense so uh, the rotors on Dragonfly are, are large, but they'd actually be much, much larger if it was flying on Earth because, because of the, the denser atmosphere uh, on Titan. So, so they say that the Cessna could get under air, into the air under pedal power. That's, that's how easy it is to fly, fly on Titan. So this, uh, this idea was proposed to NASA um, uh, with Dr. Elizabeth Turtle as the uh, principal investigator at Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Lab, and we got the wonderful news that it had been selected for flight in June of 2019. Um, we currently have a launch date of 2027, um, and we're hoping to arrive in the mid-2030s to Titan. So, um, so again, we, we, I did get my one <laughs> Titan mission for my career, uh, and I'm hope, you know, hopefully we will all be 
around uh, to, see, to see it land there on Titan in uh, about 15 years. Well, gosh, I guess it's not quite that far, far off, but uh, let's, let's, let's say a little over a decade. Um, so, so here is, uh, here is Zibby next to a one quarter scale model of Dragonfly on the day that they made the announcement. Um, our, our design has, has shifted a little bit since then, but it kind of gives you an idea. Um, it's, a, it's, it's called a quadcopter, but really there's eight rotors. Um, good to have redundancy. Um, and then skids that it lands on. It's very much like a little tiny uh, helicopter or a very, very large drone. Um, some of the features you'll notice on there, of course, we have the propellers. So with Zibby for scale, uh, you can see they are rather large uh, propellers. The whole thing is, is sort of the size of a, of a small car, I would say. We, we, had a, we had a model of it at APL, and it, if I laid down, it was sort of as, as tall as me uh, in this direction with my arms outstretched, and then about as tall as me in this, in this direction as well. So it's a substantial spacecraft, um, probably comparable to uh, Curiosity or Perseverance in size. Um, it's powered by an MMRTG, so we have our, our radio, radio isotope power, which will power a battery. Um, so we use the battery to fly. Um, the MMRTG just powers that battery. Um, we have direct to Earth communication. We don't have enough money to have a, a, an orbiting satellite uh, talking to Earth. So this constrained where we could land on Titan. Uh, for example, we couldn't land on the North Pole. Uh, because that is currently tipped away from Earth, and so that would not be possible to, to talk to Earth from the North Pole of Titan. Uh, I'll show you the instruments in, in a little bit, um, but we have uh, four main instruments on board that will be able to take measurements primarily on the surface, but also in flight. Um, one of the other uh, collaborators on the mission, uh, Dr. Dr. Ralph Lorenz, who, who kind of came up with this idea, um, likes to call Dragonfly a relocatable lander. So, so rather than thinking about it taking a bunch of measurements in flight, really the flight just allows it to hop around to new, new places to explore, and most of the science happens on the surface. Uh, here is the team uh, in May of 2018 uh, when we were working on phase A um, in a, a farm field in Columbia, Maryland, near the Applied Physics Lab. Um, and you can see here um, one of our test test drones uh, that we've been using to, to fly around. We have, it's much nicer now, and actually it has FAA license, so it's all very official. Um, but it's still flying around the same farmer's field in, in Columbia, every, every video I see of it is doing that. Um, so you can kind of get an idea of what uh, Dragonfly looks like when it's flying uh, from, this, from this video. You can see it taking off. Um, it was very exciting to, to see this in person. It's, uh, mostly automated with a, with a pilot standing by in case anything goes wrong. Of course, we can't ship the pilot to Titan, so um, you know, we're still working out all the, all the details there. <clears throat> but it will be fully autonomous, of course, when it, when it gets to Titan. And that, that work's been done by our colleagues at Penn State, as they just mentioned here. So there's the pilot just on hand in case something goes wrong, uh, but this, this drone here is flying, flying on its own. So hopefully um, this is what we'll be seeing in, in just over a decade on Titan, except the, the sky will be a different color. Oops, how do I move on? There we go. Um, given the constraints I mentioned regarding, um, you know, direct earth communication and where we can land on the surface, uh, we decided to land in the sand seas near Salt Crater. So here is a, an image of Titan from Cassini. Again, these dark patches here are the sand seas. Um, this round feature here is an impact crater known as Silk. Um, so again, we wanted to target impact craters because we know that, that is a region where there has been liquid water and organics mixing, possibly making biological molecules. But you know, an impact crater is not the best place to land. Uh, so we've decided to land just south of there in this very uh, extensive sand sea to the south of Salt Crater. Titan is an incredibly easy place to land. It's got this thick atmosphere cushioning your, your um, descent to the surface. 
So we were joking that on Mars, you have seven minutes of tater terror, whereas on Titan, we're going to have two and a half hours of moderate concern, because um, it really is uh, quite an easy place to land. And not only that, we'd be landing in the sand seas, which are very smooth, um, lots of flat landing sites, no rocks, uh, no debris to land on. Um, here's a sort of a terrestrial analog of the sort of place we're aiming to land on Titan. We think it looks similar, similar to this. So it should be a fairly easy place to land uh, a rotorcraft like like Dragonfly. <laughs> so the main goals of the mission, um, if you want to learn more about them, there's a new um, paper out in the Planetary Science Journal led by Deputy PI Jason Barnes um, talking about our science goals. Uh, but the three main categories we're looking for are understanding the prebiotic chemistry on Titan, um, understanding what environments there might be habitable, and then in then our, 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 our kind of our, our stretch goal is to search for biosignatures, either from water or hydrocarbon based life. Um, again, we don't know what life on another world might look like. Um, so we're going to be looking for chemical evidence of that. We're going to be looking for the isotopic fractionations you might expect. Life prefers lighter isotopes than, uh, than non-life. Um, Life also tends to be chiral. Um, so amino acids ha all have one particular stereoisomer. Um, so is there a difference between the isomers that we're seeing amongst the, the chemicals on Titan? You know, how complex are the organics there? Are there patterns in their distributions? Um, <clears throat> so, so these are the sort of features that we're going to be, going to be looking for. Um, here's a short video that sort of uh, outlines the science um, so you, and gives you kind of a, a preview of, of sort of the instruments that we're going to be using on Titan. So I'll just take two minutes now to, um, to play this video. Saturn's largest moon, Titan, has a thick atmosphere and a frozen surface rich in organic molecules. In 2034, a NASA mission called Dragonfly will arrive at Titan and study its chemical makeup. Dragonfly is a rotorcraft designed to visit multiple sites across the moon's varied terrain. In each new landing site on Titan's surface, Dragonfly uses a pulsed neutron generator and onboard gamma ray sensor to detect key elements such as carbon and hydrogen in organic materials or oxygen in water ice. Dragonfly determines if there are well-defined layers of these materials just below the lander. For a closer inspection, Dragonfly uses its drill to generate tailings from Titan's hard, frozen surface. These surface samples can then be ingested through the pneumatic system, carried with Titan air into the chilled sample lines into the sample collection carousel. One of the carousel sample cups is placed in a pneumatic port. The cup captures the surface material from the cold air stream and transfers it to the chemical laboratory for measurement. Pulses from a laser release large organic molecules from the surface sample for analysis in the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer sorts molecules by mass and measures diagnostic fragments that tell Dragonfly the kinds of chemical components that are present in the surface and whether there are molecules of prebiotic interest. For those potential prebiotic samples, a new cup is placed into an oven and heated to release molecules into a gas chromatograph where they are sorted for size and type before entering the mass spectrometer. This advanced separation of organic components includes isolating molecules with the same formula but different chiral arrangements, or handedness. Having a preference for one handedness over another is a key biosignature for life on Earth. When the chemical analysis is complete, Dragonfly may choose to take another surface sample or find a new location on Titan to investigate. So that that video. Um, oh, were, were you not able to see the video? No, we saw the video. Okay, excellent. <laughs> if, if not, if you had any trouble, all these videos are available on our on the Dragonfly uh, website. So you can access them after the talk as well. And I'll put the link there once I'm once I'm finished. Um, <clears throat> So, so that video alluded to several of the instruments that we have on board, which are shown here schematically in this, this diagram. 
Um, so it mentioned dragons, which is our neutron spectrometer, which will give us a bulk chemical composition uh, shown here in purple. Um, it mentioned DRAMS, which is our mass spectrometer, which will give us very detailed uh, chemical information about the surface of Titan. Uh, and this is coupled to DRACO, which is our sampling uh, system. Uh, we also have DRAGMET, which is a, a large collection of, of instruments to uh, monitor the uh, meteorology of Titan and also it's, uh, it has a seism seismograph on board. And then Dragon Cam, which is a collection of cameras, uh, which will uh, take pictures of the surface. So just to go in a little bit more detail, um, DRAMS is really, um, you know, one of the more important instruments on Dragonfly because this is going to give us the really key information we need about the uh, the biology, the potential biology uh, of the surface. It can give us very detailed chemical information. Um, it's based in part on the on the SAM instrument on Curiosity. Um, here's some some data from from that. Um, and you can see that while everything on, on Mars is chlorinated, that's what this green thing is, they were able to find evidence of, of benzene um, on the surface of Mars, which is a very interesting biomolecule. Um, and so we're hoping to use a similar uh, technique to, to identify uh, biomolecules on Titan. Uh, Dragons is our neutron spectrometer. Uh, what's, what's interesting about dragons is that um, unlike most other places in the, the solar system where you get cosmic rays and neutrons for free, uh, on Titan you have to bring your own because those are filtered out through the atmosphere. So they don't reach the surface. Um, so we've partnered with a company that normally uh, does oil exploration on Earth. Um, they send these, these uh, neutron probes down into the subsurface to look for oil. Um, so, you know, being under the surface of Earth is sort of a similar environment to being on the surface of Titan. So, uh, so we're able to use um, their technology uh, to provide neutrons, which we will then, uh, uh, you know, use on Titan to, to probe the chemical composition of the, of the near subsurface. We can go down about 10 centimeters uh, or so with dragons. And this will give us information about, is it water ice, is it organics, kind of bulk information about the composition, whereas whereas DRAMS gives us that more detailed information about the chemistry. A DRAGMET is, is sort of a, a catch-all uh, instrument. It's got a lot of different instruments for pressure, temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, uh, so on and so forth, uh, to really give us a sense of what the weather is like on Titan, a really uh, sensitive weather station for Titan. And the also really interesting uh, feature it has, as I mentioned, are, are geophones which will allow us to um, probe, uh, you know, the subsurface of Titan in a way that hasn't been, been done before. I think this will be the first icy moon that has had a, a seismograph uh, deployed on it. And then Dragon Cam, it, like I said, is a collection of different cameras. Uh, we have a pan cam, a forward looking, downward looking microscopic camera to give us that um, you know, detailed geologic information we need um, to make inferences about what's been you know, causing uh, the different processes happening on Titan. Is it fluvial? Is it aeolian? Is it a combination of those two? Um, this has been used very successfully um, on, on curiosity and perseverance to make inferences about the geology of the surface. Not pictured here, we also have an LED uh, for night imaging. Um, and UV for fluorescence, because there's actually some evidence that some really interesting molecules on Titan will fluoresce under ultraviolet light. So we'll be able to use it at night as well. Um, so as I'm wrapping up here, uh, I'm just gonna leave you with this beautiful uh, dragonfly landing sequence that hopefully uh, we will see in, in, in just over a decade on our way to Titan. So here, here is our, it's in the cruise stage, uh, ready to go, ready to enter the atmosphere. Um, there's a heat shield there to protect it as it, as it enters and several parachutes to, to slow its descent. Eventually the, the heat shield will pop off and you'll see dragonfly hidden just behind. So there it is, um, it's ready to fly. And, and we're actually, it's not gonna land on the surface. It's going to fly 
to the surface. So shortly here, it will actually be deployed from the back shell and enter the atmosphere in flight to find its first landing site. Um, so pretty dramatic moment in a planetary exploration. And then once it finds a safe place to land, it will touch down. And then we'll be ready to go. So fingers crossed for a safe landing. Um, and I want to uh, thank all my colleagues on the Dra Dragonfly team for making this possible. While I love Titan and all the science there, there's no way I would be able to engineer a wonderful spacecraft like this. So kudos to all of my very talented colleagues. Um, and thank you also for your time. I'm happy to take any of your questions now. Thanks so much, Catherine. That was really great. Uh, I know it's sometimes hard to show appreciation in these uh, virtual settings, but uh, if you please, uh, if, if you enjoyed the talk, uh, make sure to let Catherine know in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat now and I'll read them off. Um, otherwise, if, if you'd like to, if you prefer to unmute and ask the question directly, just uh, ask in the chat and I will, uh, and, and we'll unmute you. Uh, we have a question from Natasha Cordova Diba. Um, how advantageous is it to fly a prototype of Dragonfly on Earth if the atmosphere is different from Earth on Titan? Yeah, great question. So we're not flying an exact prototype uh, of Dragonfly. It has been scaled down to, for terrestrial um, applications. Um, so um, mostly what we're using the prototype to do uh, is to test our autonomous um, autonomous flight. Um, so having Dragonfly take off and maneuver and then land safely on it on its own. So I think that's been the main goal of our of our Earth sized prototype for the moment. Uh, Paul Shank asks, uh, with Huygens and now Dragonfly, how is the question of forward contamination handled? Yeah, it's a good question. I've always been a little bit concerned with, with the planetary protection aspect uh, of Titan. It's, it's only a, a class two planet, whereas, you know, Mars and Europa and Enceladus are all class four. You have to be much more careful. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the, the rationale is, is there. I, I personally would like to see a lot, you know, firmer guidelines for planetary protection on, on Dragonfly. Um, I, I guess the idea is if we did transport some sort of life form, from Earth to Titan, it's unlikely to um, develop further um, because of the conditions. Um, it would have to somehow get transported down 100 kilometers to the subsurface ocean. So I'm guessing that's that's the goal. But but I, I agree. I would like to see more planetary protection constraints for a mission like Dragonfly. Um, I have a, a question. So you mentioned that. Um, Dragonfly would have a seismometer and, uh, on it as well. Um, yeah, geophones. Mm -hmm. Geophones. Um, how would those be calibrated given that it's going to be a moving, uh, like a constantly moving rover platform? Like, do you have some idea of how that would be? Uh... Yeah, that's outside my, my area of, of expertise, uh, to be honest. Although I know we're doing a lot of testing here on Earth under uh, simulated conditions. We have this wonderful Titan chamber at, at APL at, you know, so it's at Titan temperatures and pressures where we're able to test out all of our, our instruments. Um, uh, so yes, unfortunately, I don't have a good, good answer for you. Um, it's not my area. No worries. Um, I can provide the, um, uh, the link um, to the Dragonfly website if anyone would like to check out um, some of the pictures and videos we have we have there. Um, yeah, I, I didn't share my sound properly, so my apologies for that. Cool. So yeah, if you uh, if you'd like to hit, it's, go to that website. Uh, just, Catherine posted that in the chat. Uh, another question from uh, Paul Shank. Uh, Might have missed. Uh, what in flight science is possible other than imaging? Yeah, so certainly imaging is one of them, and it'll give us a great opportunity to do stereo uh, topography of, of, the, of the regions we're flying over. Uh, my understanding is, is certain instruments on dragnet will also be <clears throat> capable of operating 
Um, so we can do atmospheric profiles in terms of pressure, temperature, humidity, and so forth as we're flying up and down in the atmosphere. So I think Dragon Cam and DragMet are the two instruments that would be used in flight. Do you have any other questions in the chat? Uh, question from Dave. Are there specific measures to prevent corrosion by Titan's atmosphere? Hmm. You know, I haven't thought about that, although you know, the uh, corrosion, I think, is from minerals dissolved in, in water, right? Um, and on Titan, we, there's not much that you can dissolve in methane, and methane itself is nonpolar. Um, so so I, I'm guessing that's not going to be a problem. Um, we're also trying to avoid the season on Titan where it's likely to rain. Um, so we're hoping that we're not going to get rained on that much. Um, and the humidity is, is pretty low in general. It is a desert world. Um, so so um, I'm not an engineer, but I, I think that's probably not gonna be a big issue on Titan. Well, that would be, uh, I know that would be a big uh, technical challenge to get rained on, but uh, it, yeah. it does sound, <laughs> taking measurements of the first uh, extraterrestrial rain event does, uh, Sounds sure. very tempting, even if it would be, make things a lot more difficult. Sure. I, I know we are concerned about mud, um, mm, you yes. know, like clogging up the, you know, because we really do not have a great idea of what the, what the materials on Titan are. Um, and so, you know, if something seems too wet, uh, too muddy, I think we're going to not sample just to be on, on the safe side. Uh, last call for questions in the chat, and maybe uh, another 30 seconds. And, uh, while people are typing those up, I just wanted to say again uh, how exciting uh, the Dragonfly mission is, especially for uh, like outer planets folks, you know, and I, I, I know I, I definitely, uh, that's what I'm looking for, relate to the idea that, you know, this is the one mission to get out there just because they have such a long lead time. So I'm really, good, really glad that uh, this got selected. Um, yes, and I love that it kind of involves everybody. You know, hmm. if you like atmospheres, you can participate. If you like interiors, you can participate. If you like chemistry, there's something there for you, geology. It really is a mission for everyone. So hopefully we'll get, um, you know, participation from the broader community as we get closer to, to landing through participating scientists calls. Um, um, oh, I don't know the mass, <laughs> um, but I would guess something on the order of curiosity or perseverance uh, mass. Um, yeah, and, and also I should mention, um, there is a, we also have a young investigators program. So if, if you know of students who are at uh, universities that are not traditionally represented by planetary science, uh, who would like to get involved. We have funds um, every year to support um, getting young investigators involved with the mission. So just another advertisement there. Fantastic. All right, well, thank you so much, Catherine. This was a really great talk. Uh, if you have any, <laughs> put some uh, thanks in the chat for her. We really appreciate that. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, it's always fun to talk about Dragonfly. Um, it really is an exciting mission. I really appreciate uh, the invitation to chat with you today. Absolutely. Thank you. So our uh, next LPI virtual seminar will be next week, the 12th of August, uh, at our usual time of 3 p.m. Central. Um, our guests will be Dr. Mallory Kinzik of uh, Johns Hopkins ADL. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, mercury. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.